I'll see a few familiar faces out there in, in, in our huge audience. <laughs> uh, yeah, this year is a, a really special year, primarily because of the 50th anniversary of the first moon landing with Apollo 11. Uh, and kind of lost in the glory of Apollo 11 were the other Apollo flights that preceded Apollo 11. Uh, Apollo 7, which orbited the Earth. Apollo 8, which circumnavigated the moon and came back, did not make a landing. And Apollo 10, which kind of repeated what Apollo 8 did, only it brought a lunar lander with it, descended down almost to the surface, and came back, which must have been incredibly frustrating <laughs> to these astronauts on board. Uh, and they purposely gave them a lunar lander that would not be able to land, would probably crash land, just as a way in case they thought they might steal the thunder on uh, Apollo 11, because some of these astronauts were pretty, pretty bold, uh, pretty aggressive guys, and um, takes a lot of courage uh, to leave the Earth, not only just to orbit the Earth, but also to go to another celestial body. Uh, I'll start first with uh, a little bit about me. As, as Chris mentioned, I worked as a senior science writer at the NASA Ames Research Center out in California. Uh, I was involved with a project that was called the Venture Star, which was going to be the replacement for the space shuttle. This was back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, NASA had a lot of technical problems with it because they were trying to uh, come up with what was called an aerospike engine, which would basically work as a jet engine, an air-breathing engine inside the atmosphere, and a rocket engine outside the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, the materials required for this engine were just beyond our te technological capability at that time. So Congress, they were pouring a lot of money into it. Congress pulled the plug, and I was out of a job. So I went back to what I was doing before I was a science writer, which was journalism. And that's how I ended up um, running a, a little community newspaper here in the Eagle. Uh, but I did. Uh, fortunately have a connection with NASA and I did, did some outreach work for them as Chris knows I uh, was what, what's called a solar system ambassador so I did a lot of school work helped kids uh, get interested in space now how did the whole idea of going to the moon start well if anyone reads science fiction you know the idea originated probably back in ancient Roman times uh, the philosopher Lucian wrote uh, a, an account of a fictional account of a flight to the moon on wings uh, and of course in those days who had who would even have a comprehension of what was required to leave leave the earth's atmosphere let alone its, its gravity but um, so the whole idea of exploring the moon was a kind of deep-seated dream in humankind uh, for many centuries and I, I assume as the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke uh, suggested in his novel 2001 A Space Odyssey, which the, moon, the movie was based on, he had a uh, prehistoric human character called Moonwatcher, if you remember the ape like creatures at the beginning of the movie, that even from our prehistoric times we were looking up at the moon and wondering about it, especially since it influences so much of biological and botanical life on our planet, uh, and it's been our close neighbor from the very beginning. But thanks to the Cold War and the competition between the US and the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, that's what really spurred us getting to the moon. I would guess maybe 100 years before we probably would have ever done it anyway. Uh, and a lot of people lament, geez, it's been 50 years, we haven't gone back to the moon. Say, Be thankful we even went, because based on how we spend money today on various projects which I have my personal opinion on, I don't think we would have even gotten to the moon. So thankfully, uh, we had a visionary president, John Kennedy, pictured here, who made the, the really quintessential speech uh, in September of 1962 at Rice University in uh, Houston, Texas. And that's when he said, we choose to go to the moon, blah, blah, blah. You've probably heard that speech or excerpts from it many times. But a number of 
uh, NASA had been in, formed in 1958 by the Eisenhower administration, again, to kind of counteract the Soviet work in trying to get the first satellite into orbit. And uh, so there were a lot of NASA uh, officials at this speech in Houston, and they were all flabbergasted because no one had told them that NASA was going to the moon. <laughs> they learned about it when they heard Kennedy give his speech. So he was very uh, what you'd like in a national leader. He had vision, uh, and he got the right people to uh, set the agenda and have a plan to follow. So really, if anyone was the father of Apollo 11 and the entire uh, lunar landing program, it was President Kennedy. Uh, but before we got to land on the moon, uh, we did have tragedy. Uh, so the Apollo program followed the first uh, Project Mercury, where the first Americans in space orbit around the Earth. Project Gemini tested rendezvous and docking in space, how a spacecraft would link up with another spacecraft on the way to the moon and back. So the very first Apollo mission was planned for early 1967, and this would be an Earth orbital mission. And unfortunately, uh, the three astronauts, uh, Roger Chafee on the left, Edward White in the center, and Gus Grissom, a Mercury and Gemini veteran astronaut, were killed in a, a freak fire on the ground doing a what they called a plugged out test for the launch that was going to be a month away. Uh, and the capsule had 100% oxygen, uh, which made pressurizing it easier. Uh, sealing it much easier, and there was so much combustible uh, Velcro in the spacecraft that that's really what fueled the fire. It was, it was never quite pinpointed. It was an electrical spark, they think, under Grissom's seat, uh, but it was never really positively determined. But uh, we always think of Velcro as the great space uh, the thing that came out of the space age was actually developed in Switzerland. It had nothing to do with the space pro program. It was developed by a Swiss scientist who studied burdocks and how they stuck to his his uh, leader hoses and hiking uh, in, the, in the Swiss Alps. And he came up with the idea for Velcro. NASA thought, geez, what a neat product. It really didn't have much of a market. So NASA uh, contracted the Swiss company to make Velcro for all kinds of things to stick in, in space, you know, while it's weightless. Well, most of the Velcro came out after the Apollo 1 accident. So even though we think of, of uh, Velcro, uh, actually Tang flew on more missions than Velcro. Uh, Tang, the orange drink. Old enough, you'll remember that. But Apollo 1 still really uh, uh, hits, hits a nerve in NASA and still does to this day. Uh, every year in, in January, NASA officials have a ceremony uh, at the Arlington National Cemetery where two of the astronauts are buried. Uh, Ed White is buried at West Point. In fact, I saw his grave a couple of months back. And um, so as, as the photo on the right there says, ad astra per aspera is a rough road leads to the stars, that lives are occasionally sacrificed uh, in using such a complex technology. <clears throat> but after the Apollo 1 fire uh, and before Apollo 11, there were some pretty spectacular achievements. I'm gonna drink this water because there isn't much on the moon. Uh, Apollo 7 was the replacement for Apollo 1. All the Apollo 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 <clears throat> were all unmanned tests before they were sure that the redesigned Apollo capsule minus the Velcro would, would do well in space. So Apollo 7 <clears throat> was successful and that was in October. Apollo 8 which to me is actually my favorite mission because it was the first to go to the moon, though not the first to land. That was a famous Christmas time mission where the astronauts read uh, excerpts from the book of Genesis uh, in orbit around the moon. 
and Apollo 10 followed in May, and that was a dress rehearsal for Apollo 11. And it was virtually identical to the Apollo 11 mission. As I said, they even brought a lunar lander with them, uh, descended partway to the lunar surface, and came back. Well, thinking about 50 years ago, where were you? Some of you probably weren't even born, some of the younger kids here. But 1969 was a, was a pretty tumultuous year, as were most of the late 60s. Uh, I threw up a couple of headlines there. There are far, far too many controversial uh, and earth-shaking events of that year. Uh, the Vietnam War, the murder of Sharon Tate by the Manson gang, uh, the amazing Mets, they were their first World Series. Uh, of course, Hippie Fest, AKA Woodstock, which was in August, the month after Apollo 11. And then Paul McCartney, is he dead, is he not? Uh, which was a big marketing gimmick by the Beatles. And then of course, other sports superheroes like Joe Namath there of the New York Jets. But that, that just gives you some idea of you know, who was born 1969, I won't get into details, but I was surprised that popular films were uh, Hello, Dolly, the, the first Italian job, not the remake, which came a few years later, and Battle of Britain. So anyway, 1969, um, also the movie Easy Rider, which I just watched to get me in the 1969 frame of mind, which is basically stoned. <laughs> so, where were you in 1969? For those of us with gray hair in the audience here, uh, we were probably sitting like this little girl in front of her TV set. Uh, you may have been slightly older. I'm age 65 this year, so I was 15. Uh, I was a teenager, gawky teenager, uh, who was into space back then. Never quite grew out of it, but uh, everyone watched it live on TV. Uh, there you can see a group of moms with their kids out reading the latest in the New York Daily News, Men Walk on the Moon. And that was the headline uh, the day after on, at the New York Times, Men Walk on the Moon, Astronauts Land on the Plane, as you can read. So the, the biggest discovery there that they reported scientifically was that it had a powdery surface. And we'll get into this talk while I do touch on the engineering uh, feet of, of Apollo 11. I'm, I'm kind of more interested in what what kind of science did Apollo 11 do and what did we learn about the moon. But that's an iconic photo, not of Apollo 11, but one of the later Apollos. I think it was Apollo 16, because you can see a, a mountain in the background, which there were no mountains around where Apollo 11 landed. But the, you know, it's kind of like the Titanic and her sister ships. They all looked alike. They had minor differences and improvements as the missions went on, but the lunar lander there, Apollo 16, looks pretty much like Apollo 11. Uh, this is Apollo 11. I think that's Aldrin uh, Armstrong took the picture of the famous uh, flag, which all the moon hoaxers say, you know, it's flapping in the wind, so therefore it must have been done in a Hollywood studio. I, I won't comment anymore on, on those folks. They live on a flat earth. Anyway, the moon, uh, everyone knows the moon. You can look out at night, your chance to see a, a, another planet, planetoid, close, close enough that you can pick out features with a pair of binoculars or telescope. So you can see impact craters, volcanoes, uh, planes, all kinds of neat features right out of your own backyard. So if anyone says, can you see a volcano in Vermont? You said, yeah, I can see plenty of them. Just look at the moon. Uh, the red numbers there are the landing sites. You can see Apollo 11 is just about on the equator of the moon, and that was in the uh, uh, Sea of Tranquility, Mare Tranquillitatis, which is the Latin name. And then Apollo 12, which followed, is way over on the other side, again on another plane uh, on the equator. Most of the, Apo the early Apollos uh, Apollo 13, which never made the landing because it had an emergency and had to come back, would have landed somewhere in between 14 and 11. Uh, and the reason they liked the equator was, first of all, it was flat terrain, easy to land, and you didn't have to expend as much fuel to get back up into orbit to link up with the command module and return to Earth. 
But the later Apollo missions got a little bolder and they went uh, higher in latitude, like Apollo 15 was up there in the, in the mountains of the moon. Okay, a brief overview of, of what an Apollo mission was like. Uh, the Apollo 11 uh, mission was the fifth manned flight using that uh, command command module, and that's a, a, a cutaway view of the command module, which is the only part of the spacecraft that returned to Earth. And it was, um, uh, a lot of the engineers described Project Mercury space capsule as about the size of a, of a phone booth. The Gemini capsule, which followed Mercury, was about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, so uh, the Apollo, I would say, is probably the, the, a little roomier, maybe a uh, minivan uh, minus access to the hatch part of the minivan. So while while it held three astronauts, uh, you didn't want to even a week trip, three days to the moon and three days back, and a day or two on the moon was still pushing it as far as comfort went. It was not a comfortable spacecraft. Uh, the whole Apollo assembly was launched by a giant Saturn V rocket, which was about 365 feet tall. NASA built what was called the VAB, or Vehicle Assembly Building, and that was where all the stages and stacks and the spacecraft were put together, protected inside. They could work even when there was a hurricane hitting Florida, which often happened. And uh, the VAB was purpose, repurposed later used for Skylab, was used for the space shuttle, and it will be used on the new return to the moon, Orion, uh, what they call the SLS, which I'll talk about at the very end, but not to get ahead. Uh, well, I said 365, 363 feet. Uh, so the Saturn V was a really successful uh, launcher, and even from the very first uh, uncrewed test, it, it, it was successful. And uh, a lot of it, one of, you mentioned uh, Werner von Braun, the German scientist who worked on the V-2 rockets uh, during World War II, was not a friend to a lot of British people. Um, a lot of people you know, still claimed he had Nazi connections. He did, but um, in fairness to von Braun, he was kind of forced, you know, what was his alternative? Um, he was the brains of the operation in building rockets before World War II, uh, you know, and for him to have refused probably would have put him either in a, uh, a Stalag somewhere or maybe even executed, who knows. So uh, Von Braun's gotten a lot of bad press in recent years, but uh, I'll defend him to the end. He, he became an American citizen and um, yes, there was slave labor uh, at the V2 plants, but um, I don't know. If I were in his position, what would I do? Refuse? Would you refuse? I don't know. Uh, that's a matter of personal conscience thing. But it did take, uh, as it says there, two and a half hours uh, to, to do a checkout period once the spacecraft was in orbit. So that's a night shot of, uh, I think, one of the later Apollo, or my, that might have been Apollo 5, actually, the unmanned test. So that's your basic uh, architecture for Apollo. On the far left is the assembled Saturn V. Um, on the far right is a kind of a early test uh, rocket called the Saturn I. Uh, there is no Saturn III, uh, II, III, or IV. They were designed but not built because once they built the Saturn I, they realized, you know, we've done enough tests. Uh, we have the engineering capability to just go right to the five. So that's why two, three, and four were not built. But if you go on the internet, you can find drawings of what those intermediate Saturns would have looked like, and they didn't look too different. Uh, they just kind of progressed in pounds of thrust and in height. So the very top of the Saturn, where you see the pointy thing, is the launch escape system. And that was a rocket propelled that was, that was used in Project Mercury, uh, used on Project Apollo, and will be used for the new Orion spacecraft that NASA is going to launch next year, two years from now, as a test. 
uh, and it rapidly uh, exits the uh, launch platform with the astronauts in the, in the capsule in case there's an explosion. So the, <clears throat> the, the astronauts, um, pretty sure they have total control over that. The ground might have their finger on the button just in case, but it's usually the commander who decides should I abort or not. But packed in under the little uh, shroud there is the lunar module with the little legs, its spindly legs folded up. And all that would come apart once it got in Earth orbit. Uh, and uh, the command module would turn around and pull out the LEM. And then the astronauts would transfer into it and get it all set up for landing. So the, um, as I had mentioned, Apollo 10 was pretty much an exact uh, dress rehearsal for Apollo 11. Doesn't get a lot of, uh, nobody seemed to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo 10, which was last uh, November, I think it was. Uh, no, I'm, yes, would have been, no, no, May, May of this year was, it was, Apollo 10 was in May and Apollo 11, the actual landing was you know, in July. So they were almost back to back. And there you see one of the lunar landers on the surface, what it looks like. There's a lot of gold foil on it. That was uh, to act uh, as an insulator and also to reflect uh, solar heat, which would get very high. And in space, the uh, command module and service module, the astronauts were in this section. This had all the oxygen, water, electricals, uh, propellants, and all that. This whole thing had to be rotated like on a rotisserie, uh, and that was just to evenly heat and cool the spacecraft. And that's still done today. Uh, and they spin test spacecraft, whether they're robot, unmanned spacecraft, or, or crewed spacecraft, just to make sure that, that they'll spin once they're in orbit. And that's merely the spread the, the uh, heat around. I thought this was kind of a neat, it was actually a French um, cartoon at the time of Apollo. And I think it ran in one of the Paris newspapers. I think it's French, yeah. Uh, but it's kind of a nice view, it's cartoonish, but it, it gives you a cool view of the inside of the command module. And you see uh, one astronaut sitting and the other one down below in what was the navigation area. And that's where they had their uh, little astrolabe or telescope where they would do the, the navigating. Uh, and it's just mind-boggling to me that uh, you can navigate in space. And if, if you're interested in, in stellar navigation, um, there's many courses you can take. Uh, and it requires a lot of mathematics. But that's just kind of a nice uh, cartoonish view of what the inside of the command module look. Of course, very kind of exaggerated because it's hard to get it all in one picture. But it's very narrow, three seats, um, and you have a little bay down below where you could prepare food and then do your, your stellar navigation. Uh, the, the, I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but when they return to Earth in the upper right, it's an old NASA uh, artist rendering the command module, the cone-shaped part with the three astronauts in, would break away from the service module, the, the large cylindrical part below, and that would just plummet back into the Earth's atmosphere uh, uncontrolled. Of course, the astronauts came back uh, through re-entry and then parachutes and landed. They did ocean landings. They were not prepared for uh, land landings like the space shuttle. The Gemini uh, sp spacecraft, a few years earlier than Apollo, had done some training on land, uh, emergency landing landings, but for some reason, I don't know if it was because of maybe the hazard of landing, hard impact landing, the command modules uh, did ocean landings. Interesting thing is the Russians uh, were pioneers in land hard, hard impact landings, and they still do it today with their Soyuz spacecraft. And their Soyuz spacecraft, when you think about it, is basically their version of that they built to go to the moon is still flying. So we, we developed all this architecture, then dumped it. <laughs> and you know, typical American style, we throw it away, 
and then come back years later and say, why did we do that? And let's reinvent the wheel. So that's what we're doing today, is basically re reinventing the Apollo and updating it. The lunar module was the neat uh, spacecraft because it was not designed to fly within an atmosphere. Uh, it was made of aluminum and titanium and really paper thin. I mean, you could, you could take a uh, pencil and punch a hole through it. It was that, that fragile. Uh, it looks a lot more robust than it actually was. Uh, speaking of punching a pen or a pencil through the lunar lander, um, I picked up a official Fisher space pen, which was made by the Fisher Pen Company for NASA, was used on the Gemini and Apollo flights, and you can get it at, uh, give, give them a little plug, the stationery store here in Middlebury. They sell them, they're very cool. And they, exact same design, they can write upside down, they can write in case you decide you wanna uh, go into space someday, you, you can bring your pen with you. <laughs> or if you can't go and wanna just pretend, buy one, they're only 25 bucks. It, it's probably the best buy of space technology that's still available today and right here in Middlebury. Ah, Apollo 11's flight profile looks pretty complicated. So you had to plan your launch uh, and what they call the trans-Earth trajectory to get to the moon before the moon was there. So on launch day, the moon's down here, but you're planning to get to the moon when it's up there in its orbit, in that position. So again, that took a lot of high-level mathematics and computing to do, and then um, you also had to plan the return the same way. Uh, the Earth would not be in the same position that it was when you left the moon. Okay, the crew, the prime crew, the men who actually made the flight, uh, Neil Armstrong on the left, Michael Collins center, and Edward Edwin Buzz Aldrin on the right. Uh, Neil Armstrong died just a couple years ago. Michael Collins is still alive, but you don't hear much about him. Uh, and Buzz is in the news all the time. He's, he's a camera hound. So, a camera hound. He likes to be in front of the camera. Uh, Neil Armstrong, uh, as I said there, was born in Ohio, uh, August 5th, 1930. He was a Korean War vet, pilot, uh, and he was one of NASA's first civilian, uh, if you want to call them pre-astronauts, um, he was an X-15 pilot. The X-15 was a aerospace plane designed in the 50s and went to the edge of space and actually Neil Armstrong went high enough that he got his astronaut wings before actually flying in a bona fide spacecraft because technically, uh, well, there's arguments between the French, the Russians, and the Americans about where space begins. Uh, for some, space begins at about 60 miles above ground level. For others, it's higher. It's 75, 90, even up to 90 miles, an hour, uh, 90 miles above. But the US awarded a number of Air Force pilots their astronaut wings because they got a, at least 50 miles in altitude. Uh, so Neil, uh, his first space flight was Apollo 8 in 1966, which was almost a disaster. He saved that mission. Uh, they, they were doing a, pra a practice rendezvous and docking, in fact, for the lunar program. And uh, the thrusters, the yaw, the pitch and yaw thrusters on the Gemini 8 got stuck. They were on the open and put the spacecraft in a wild spin. It was making one revolution a second, which, I mean, I, my lunch would have been all over the cabin. This guy was just a phenomenal pilot, cool as anyone could possibly be, the ideal choice for the first lunar lander mission. Uh, he figured out how to bring the spacecraft uh, out of the spin, and it was basically tumbling end over end, getting to the point where the gravitational force was enough that would blacked out both him and his co-pilot. So uh, he had very cool, very cool head, very calm. Uh, just the kind of person you wanted to be with <coughs> under duress. 
And you know, a lot of these astronauts were like that. And they, I would assume they, you know, learned their their chops in the wars, Korean War, World War II, uh, and as pilots, you know, they had all kinds of, you know, harrowing experiences. So they were perfect candidates uh, for for a spacecraft. Now, Neil Armstrong was the first civilian uh, astronaut in the X-15 program. And um, even though he was in the Air Force, he was not an Air Force officer at the time. Uh, Buzz Aldrin, the second human on the, the moon, he was born in Montclair, New Jersey. Uh, he was in the Air Force uh, and really was kind of genius level in um, aeronautical engineering. Um, I would say probably on an IQ level, he was probably the highest IQ astronaut. I don't know about today's astronauts, but um, Aldrin was quite a brilliant guy. He pretty much figured out how to do the rendezvous and docking. He came up with some of the concepts that were used in Apollo. Uh, and he didn't get the credit, I don't think, that, that he deserved. But he also flew in uh, the Gemini program, which was kind of the prelude to Apollo. So he walked in space before uh, Apollo 11. So he was a veteran, as far as veterans could, could be in those days. And Michael Collins, he was the astronaut who orbited the moon while the two landed, landed on the moon. Uh, he was born in Rome, Italy. He's not Italian, but his father was in the military at a, a military base in Italy. And uh, he, John, John Glenn was actually his, his hero. And uh, he got the inspiration to become an astronaut after he met John Glenn. And Glenn read his resume and said, you know, you should consider being an astronaut. And he did and uh, went to the moon. Uh, there was a backup crew. All these Apollo missions had three backup crew in case somebody got sick. If you saw the movie Apollo 13, you could see how a backup crew becomes important because one of the main astronauts comes down, or they think he comes down with one of the measles, something, a chicken pox, I don't remember. Uh, and they immediately put in the substitute backup pilot, even though, as it turned out, he didn't uh, have the disease, but they put him in quarantine. All right, the Apollo 11 uh, flight schedule, this is kind of it in a nutshell, uh, gives you the launch date which was July 16th at 8.32 a.m. Uh, and then, of course, on the far right is the column, and that's the mission elapsed time, how many hours into the mission. So roughly, um, it takes you three days, well, four days to go to the moon. That's counting almost a day in orbit, checking things out here around Earth. But three days transit to the moon, it's not that far away, it's a quarter of a million miles. Um, you can do it with conventional technology. It'll still take us three days to get to the moon, even with the new rocket that NASA's building. And then that takes you all the way through, at the very end, the last splashdown uh, event on the flight schedule was July 24th at 11.50 a.m. in the Pacific Ocean, and they were picked up by the USS Hornet. Uh, the interesting thing about Apollo 11 What's of interest to me, too, is the geology side is, well, why did we, okay, we went to the moon for political reasons, for national prestige, but all the scientists involved, they could care less about the political reasons. They were interested in what's on the moon, what's it made of, is it like the Earth, is it different, could there be life on the moon, is there any kind of an atmosphere? So, uh, along with all the hoopla that went with Apollo was also a lot of science experiments, and, and I'll kind of go through them quickly. Uh, Apollo 11 brought the first samples back, and um, I have what are called analogs, Earth analogs, of some of the main types of moon rocks, and I'll pass those around uh, when I get to that slide that'll make it more, more appropriate. But uh, roughly 50 rocks were brought back from the moon, it says 22 kilograms. It was a lot of material, um, and that included bag, you know, polyurethane bags, well, actually Teflon bags filled with moon dust, um, 
And as soon as Neil Armstrong stepped out on the lunar surface, he did what was called a contingency sample. And that was, in case they had to quickly get back in the spacecraft and return, it would be very embarrassing to do that and not come back with anything. And say, you went to the moon for billions of dollars and you didn't even bring back a rock. You know, it's like, you know, you went, you went to the beach and you didn't get me Turkish taffy, you know, saltwater taffy, something to bring back from your vacation. Bring so they back. did. Uh, bring me back a shell. Yeah, right, bring me back a shell, something, flip-flops, a t-shirt. Well, so they quickly, uh, it's, that is Neil Armstrong, gathered, gathered up a contingency sample. So he went around as fast as he could, as soon as he, you know, he set up the flag, did his, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, the first famous words. Then he immediately went about, I gotta collect some rocks, which he did, got it back on the spacecraft. Then they could kind of leisurely follow their flight plan on the surface. So those contingency samples are considered among the 50 rocks. But at the very bottom there, it says two main types of rocks, basalts, and I'll pass this around, that's basalt, and a weird word, which is a German word, or Italian word called Brescia. And what I'm passing there, the big heavy rock is a piece of basalt, AKA lava, and it's got uh, little holes in it, those are called bugs, where the gas comes out. That's actually a piece that you're uh, passing around from Craters of the Moon, ironically, National Monument in Idaho, where the astronauts did some training. Uh, and it's very much like the, the basalt you find on the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, I picked a gray rock because it's more like the lunar basalts. A lot of the basalts, say, in the Hawaiian Islands have red, red in it, which is more iron. There's a little higher iron content than uh, the lunar uh, lavas. So that's basalt is a form of lava. Now this little Brescia piece is actually composed of all kinds of different rocks that were on the moon. This is not a lunar rock. This is from a near a meteor crater in Chile. And it's basically molten rock. It's from the, the impact creates such tremendous heat and pressure that the rock is, is uh, liquefied and it mixes with other rocks on the surface. So it's this kind of porridge of rocks and that's what's called a brescia. So those were the two main types and actually, there's a third main type, um, which is called a northosite. And this is what they found in the highlands of the moon, in the moon, lunar mountains. And that's a piece of a northosite from the high peaks of the Adirondacks, which is one of the few places on Earth you can find moon rocks. And I don't mean real moon rocks, but the same chemical composition of, of moon rocks found on the moon, on the highlands of the moon. So if you go up to Mount Marcy, uh, Whiteface Mountain, if you go up to the uh, weather station up on, you can, you can drive up there or take the ski lift. That's basically the same kind of rock. So comparison of the Earth and the Moon, you can see the size of the Moon in that picture is roughly about the diameter of uh, the narrow part of Africa, which is shown in that picture. It's roughly, if you imagine New York City here, and San Francisco about there, that's about how wide the moon is, just about the width of the continental United States. So the astronauts, even though they were pilots, got trained in geology, uh, and they learned rather quickly, they were smart guys, uh, and they got versed in lingo, the geologist lingo. They also learned a little bit about what the lunar surface was gonna look like, how to walk on it, that's why they visited places like Craters of the Moon, the big meteor crater in Arizona. They, they looked at that, trained in there, looked at uh, the kind of rocks you find at impact craters, volcanic craters. But that's a, your basic uh, cutaway of what a lunar surface looks like. It's not, it's not beautiful like Earth. It's, it's basically a dead world uh, made up of ancient impacts, even modern impacts. Uh, these little, what are called rills, linear rills. Uh, most of them were formed by, by molten lava that formed kind of like lava tubes. If, you, if you've ever been out west 
Craters of the Moon is one place. Arizona, you can see lava caves. Uh, it's lava caves where the roof of the cave has collapsed. Uh, but they're not just impact craters. There's a lot of, there are volcanoes. About 20% of the craters on the moon are volcanic. Uh, at around the time of Apollo, they thought that that would have been a really high number. Subsequent study of the moon reveals that there are more volcanic craters on the moon than they used to think. And that's a cutaway. To the, there is a uh, probably a partially molten core inside the moon like the Earth. Uh, so the moon is not by any means, the surface looks dead. There's no atmosphere to speak of, uh, no life. But geologically, the moon is still somewhat alive. Uh, there are moon quakes. Uh, occasionally, astronomers have seen clouds that are probably outgassing of carbon dioxide or other hydrogen gas inside the moon. So there probably is some, um, some level of geologic activity in the moon, not something that happens a lot. But the lunar surface there also gets bombarded by the solar wind, which really causes uh, erosion. So when you look at a picture of the moon surface from Apollo, uh, everyone thought the moons, the mountains on the moon were going to be these jagged, big, you know, awesome mountains. And they turned out to be these rounded, kind of boring, Appalachian-looking hills. And it's like, how could you have erosion on the moon? There's no water, there's no well. The sun, the sun and micrometeorites over billions of years have worn the lunar mountains to, they're tall, but they're, they're not jagged. Now there's, if you compare that uh, piece that was passing around, the salt and lava, that was one of the uh, samples brought back from Apollo 11. I would dare say almost identical to that piece uh, I was passing around. And that's uh, an Apollo 11 Brescia, again, made fragments of minerals and rocks that are cemented together from, from uh, lunar uh, meteorite bombardments, which in the early history of the moon, uh, it was almost entirely molten with constant impacts. And there's a lunar anorthosite, the kind you find in the high peaks of the Adirondacks. And also, I think if you go along the southern shore of Lake Superior, there's outcrops of that. Uh, the north side. It was basically an igneous um, rock um, that formed, you know, would have been seas of this molten rock early in the moon's history. And then, of course, it, it got buried and pummeled as the meteors hit the lunar surface over time. Now, a close up view of what lunar soil looks like uh, it's kind of a mishmash, again, of rock chips, of basalt. Uh, it's got little impact glasses, and I'll pass this one around. This is called a tektite. These are found on Earth. Uh, most scientists think all tektites were created here on Earth by meteorite impacts. There is a minority of, ast of astronomers who think some tektites, in particular the ones found in Australia, in Indonesia, in Southeast Asia, might very well be Blown, have been blown off the moon. That one is a Southeast Asian tektite, so you could be holding a piece of the moon there. It's not really definitive. There's, they have to go back and look. Uh, they didn't look in enough places. The moon is big, and you only consider the few Apollo missions that landed. But you can see some, there's impact glass, and there's even volcanic glass. So that looks a lot like obsidian, which is volcanic glass. Native Americans made obsidian arrowheads and things. It's, it's um, really like some of the best glass made by Corning uh, you can find Mother Nature making in volcanoes or in meteor impacts. They're almost identical, which is why it makes it hard to sometimes differentiate. Uh, this was a little uh, 1969, well, I think it was a 1970 comic strip that ran in some newspapers called Frontiers of Science. And that uh, follows the story of the mystery of tektites. And I put the two uh, NASA uh, scientists who worked on that, Dean Chapman, he was at Ames Research Center where I worked. I didn't meet him, but I met his uh, widow. Uh, had a, actually a nice afternoon tea with her, and she shared a lot of his um, 
his memories that he and her memories as well of of the Apollo missions, and he did a lot of the geological work. And then Dr. John O'Keefe, who I did meet right before he died, and he wrote a nice um, uh, little blurb for my book. Uh, he did a lot of work on tektites, but also on the lunar geology program. He helped train the astronauts what to look for. Um, he and another geologist named Gene Shoemaker, who you may know from National Geographic specials back into the 80s. But the astronauts had to be trained on how to collect these rocks. It wasn't just like, uh, let's walk along the beach and you know pick up some driftwood. And they, they had to uh, be trained as to recognize what kind of rocks should I pick up and collect and bring back to Earth. I mean, this was important. You only get maybe one chance in a lifetime to bring rocks back. So they, NASA developed tools, and they included hammers, which basically looked like a geological hammer, scoops, tongs, scoops. Uh, there's a, a tongue. This is actually from Apollo 12, the mission right after 11. But, uh, you know, these guys, even though they're in these big, bulky suits, they don't weigh that much. You know, on Earth, once they're suited with the air conditioner pack, they probably weigh over 300 pounds. On the moon, I don't know, 75 pounds? Doesn't sound like a lot. But all you have to do is bend over and fall. If you look at some of the Apollo footage of some of the astronauts, I think the one who was, maybe it was Alan Shepard swinging the uh, golf club. You know, kind of lost his balance and fell backwards. And then they kind of just look very comical bouncing around. It's easy to lose your balance when, when you don't have a lot of gravity and you're bulky in those things. But anyway, that was a tongue. So they would basically use it. It was a long extender. It, it was like a telescoping arm. They didn't have to bend down too much. They could clamp the rock, pick it up, and then drop it in a bag. And then they would uh, put the bag back in the spacecraft. Uh, scoops, nothing too original about that, although uh, I don't know what the individual price of that scoop was, but I bet it costs more now on eBay but in an auction than it was when they actually uh, manufactured it. But these were all custom built, you know, high precision tools made of lightweight metals, you know, titanium, and aluminum, very expensive. So these were mostly done for trenching, where they could dig a little trench and then look if there's any layering and what the layering would tell them. You know, was it uh, sedimentary layering? Was it layering by meteorite impact? So a lot of this stuff, when they went to the moon, they didn't know what they would find. And there's another, uh, a rake, a rake and a uh, kind of a combined scoop and rake for small pebbles. Uh, both on, well, this is Apollo 12 photograph. And almost identical to that was Apollo 11. They used these little coring tubes. So they would actually be able to bring back core samples, like you see uh, if you watch any of the science documentaries, scientists in Greenland who maybe do ice coring, they did that with the moon so they could go down, not too deep, but deep enough so that they could have a cross section. And all those cores are still, uh, most of them are with NASA. A lot of them NASA shared with scientists around the world, just as they did with the lunar samples. Uh, this was an electric drill not used on Apollo 11, 12, but 15, 16, and 17, the last three flights to the moon, they used a drill again so they could uh, three meters, pretty deep, and get, again, better core samples for the geologists to look at. Now, Apollo 11, for all its great uh, achievements in, first of all, getting people to the moon and getting them back safely, had a lot of good science experiments. And the first one, uh, which I looked at, is called the Passive Seismic Experiment. And this was to detect whether or not the moon had quakes, moonquakes, not earthquakes. And yes, indeed, the moon does have moonquakes. So that means there's something active going on, uh, faulting, uh, maybe deep movement of, of uh, you know, subterranean magmas, things like that. So that all that uh, even impacts um, of, of meteors on the moon register as moonquakes. Now that device there that you can see uh, the Apollo astronaut doing with it looks a little better, a little clearer. Here, I'll flip back. If you see that little copper core there in the center, that's this thing. 
And this was a multi-purpose uh, experiment. It was actually, uh, kind of looks like a satellite. It had solar panels. Uh, it had handles so the astronaut could bring it out on the moon and then pull it out. It was almost like an accordion. So set up the solar panels. And it had multiple experiments on it. It had um, uh, a little isotope heater, basically used a, a nuclear power source. I think it was a tiny little bit of plutonium. Not to run the electricity, but just to keep it from, from freezing. And then it used the solar panels for electrical power. Uh, and so it had a lot of nifty uh, features on it. Uh, another experiment was called the soil mechanics test. And this was a rod that they stuck under the uh, lunar lander pad. You can see that little gold foil pad and then the, the rod sticking out from underneath it. And this, this was a, a way to measure how deep the dust was on the surface. So a couple of the uh, geologists before Apollo went to the moon thought that, you know, I don't think we can even land on the moon because they're going to land, they're going to go into this deep dust because it's been accumulating there for billions of years. The solar wind has been uh, pulverizing rock and mountains and they're just going to sink into like quicksand uh, into this lunar dust. And as it turned out, of course, the dust uh, wasn't that deep where they landed. Uh, there may be places on the moon in you know, dark recessed valleys where there are dust, deeper drifts of lunar dust, but uh, no one's ever seen them, and that's all speculation, and we'll have to wait for a future exploration of it. Uh, the third Apollo experiment uh, was the solar wind experiment. Uh, not a real sophisticated looking thing, it was just kind of a metal foil that was pulled out, and what they did was left it out there while they were on the moon surface doing their other rock collecting and and that foil would collect uh, microscopic particles that came off the sun and then they would bring it back uh, and analyze it for what was in there like bits of argon, bits of uh, hydrogen, things blown off the sun that actually end up on the lunar surface and that was all collected on that foil. Uh, the interesting thing uh, is this laser ranging retro reflector experiment. You can see this little thing which kind of looks like a, so, like a small solar panel. Uh, and that, ironically, is still up on the moon and is the only Apollo 11 experiment that's still working. After all the 50 years later, they're still using it to test. Uh, they'll shoot a laser beam onto that and it'll give you the distance between the Earth and the moon within six inches and it can tell you how the moon changes over time. Uh, and it confirmed the idea that the moon is not getting closer to the Earth, it's moving away from the Earth. So in the far distant future, um, you won't see much of the moon. It will recede until it, it probably breaks away and is gone. But I mentioned there that from 1969 to 85, the McDonald Observatory in Texas, uh, they do, if you listen to public radio, um, you'll, you'll occasionally hear their little science reports from McDonald Observatory. They're a very active uh, observatory, and they have a big telescope, 107 inches in diameter. Anyway, they did a lot of the observations, bouncing lasers off that uh, uh, laser reflector. And Apollo 11 was the first one, but the Russians, they put two, uh, of course, they didn't land people on the moon, but they were robot landers, uh, Luna 17 and 21, I think. And then the other Apollo mission. So all those reflectors are still up there. They're still reflecting. They haven't been covered over too much by dust. Um, so they're still useful uh, scientific tools. Uh, okay, then, then there was, again, there's that uh, little portable experiment package that also included the lunar dust detecting experiment. And this was to determine how, how much dust accumulates on the moon. So uh, you know your house from vacuuming how much dust accumulates in your house, maybe not as scientifically as NASA does. No, it accumulates on the moon. 
but it does. Like you wonder, where does this dust come from? Um, if you don't have pets, your house is just as dusty. Uh, it, dust is everywhere, and it's all particles. Here on Earth, it includes biological material, dead skin cells, uh, plant material, pollen. On the moon, most of it is, is pulverized rock. It's also uh, solar wind particles, all that mixes in and accumulates, which gave the idea of maybe the dust on the moon was really deep, but of course it wasn't. Uh, experiment number five, this was a magnetometer, and it was basically set up to figure out whether or not the moon had a magnetic field like the Earth. Uh, it has a, has a minor one, not real strong, and uh, but there are variations in the lunar's lunar magnetic field. So depending on where you are in the moon, it could be stronger or weaker. And that has to do with concentrations of real heavy material, probably iron, underneath the crust of the moon. So all these experiments were conducted on Apollo 11 within 24 hours. I mean, these guys were on the moon for a very short period of time, unlike the later missions. Uh, they were basically down and back. They didn't want to risk anything with the first mission. They wanted, wanted to be successful and to, to prove everything worked. So uh, they deployed their experiments. They collected rocks. Uh, the Apollo 11 crew did not have time to fool around or play with their golf swing like they did on the later missions where they had a little, a little fun time built into the mission because they had more time on the surface. But uh, on the later missions, when they would sleep on the lunar module, they had to sleep standing up because there was no place to sit down. It was basically two side by side inside something about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Uh, and it was not, not a comfortable place to spend on the long term. Uh, I see we're an hour in. I only have a few more to go here. But uh, you want me to continue? OK. Uh, the Apollo 11 landing site uh, was kind of interesting what it had looked like. Uh, NASA made a little map, uh, and it shows where the lander was and how Neil Armstrong very deftly avoided landing in some of these larger craters. In fact, when he was landing, he, where they were supposed to land originally was a field of boulders uh, and house-sized boulders. So he made the command decision of, I'm going to keep flying. And he had only seconds left of fuel before he set it down on a very gentle plane. So even with all the, the pre-planning, uh, they didn't get the landing site right. And thankfully, uh, he had just enough fuel. Had it been, had he, had that boulder field been bigger, he might have run out of fuel. And who knows what would have happened. Now, returning uh, to Earth, the, what was called the ascent stage of the lunar lander. This was the only part that returned from the moon, not to Earth, but back into lunar orbit, and it left the landing uh, stage, then, which basically acted as a platform. Uh, I mentioned there that the spacecraft at liftoff weighed 10,000 pounds on Earth. Uh, on the moon, it was only 1,700 pounds, so this thing was when you're on the moon, it's incredibly light, which is why if you want to do the lunar diet, that's the best thing to do, is weigh yourself on Earth and go to the moon and say, hey, I lost lots of weight. I didn't have to, I could still eat what I want. Mm -hmm. um, but that's thanks to gravity. So you can see the two astronauts in the little schematic on the left there, the cutaway that shows them standing, and then the two fuel pods on left and right, uh, that was their ascent fuel and their propulsion uh, to maneuver the, the spacecraft when they had to rendezvous with Mike Collins, who was still up in orbit. Now, I'm not going to do the return to the Earth was all pretty much as it was going to the moon. Uh, they jettisoned the service module, and in this NASA artist rendering, it shows the command module coming back into the Earth's atmosphere. The angle had to be right. Uh, it was very easy to hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere like a stone on a pond and skip out into space, in which case they would have had no chance to return because they had already dumped their service module. They had no propulsion fuel. So they had to rely 
completely on the computations of the Earth engineers to get them back, and also the, uh, the astronauts themselves for piloting the return to get it just right. And they did. Not, not a single Apollo, unlike the later Challengers, was lost in orbit. Uh, three large parachutes unfurled for the landing, and that was, again, a water landing in the Pacific. And the three astronauts, this is not what they looked like right, this was during a training mission when they actually got out of the capsule, they were wearing isolation suits, as I'll show you coming up. Uh, but the three Apollo 11 astronauts here were training how to get out of the spacecraft. They all got seasick. Uh, and you can imagine, I mean, the thing flipped over, then returned. Uh, you could come down on a really high sea. Uh, and, you know, these were Air Force guys, not Navy guys. Even the Navy guys got sick. Um, and they were put in an isolation van. There's President Nixon. He was on board the Hornet when they... Uh, picked up the space capsule that came out, and he talked to them and congratulated them. Uh, that was the isolation suit. Actually, when they got out of the spacecraft, uh, they put these suits on inside the spacecraft before they stepped out into the atmosphere because NASA wasn't completely sure whether or not there were any contaminants, i.e. microorganisms, on the moon. Uh, as it turns out, the moon is sterile, there's nothing alive on it, but it was a precaution and also kind of a prelude to what astronauts who go to Mars will probably do the same thing when they come back. Because while we haven't found life on Mars, there's always a possibility that there might be pathogens, something that, you know, Earth, Earth animals, people can't, can't cope with. So um, that was a, a wise precaution. Not only that, was it a wise precaution, but that same year, does anyone remember seeing the movie The Andromeda Strain? That movie came out the same year, I believe, as the Apollo landing. So we got a lot of people interested about extraterrestrial life, in particular extraterrestrial viruses and bacteria. And uh, NASA wasn't going to fool around. So what did, what did we actually learn about the moon from the Apollo 11 mission? Well, we learned, first of all, that a lot of the rocks on the moon are very similar to rocks on Earth. As you saw, the lava, the basalt, the brescia, the impact brescia, the, the glasses, the anorthosite. Uh, but a lot of these rocks on the moon are far older than some of the oldest rocks on Earth. Does anyone know why that might be? I mean, there obviously could be a couple of reasons. Any, any guesses? Yeah. Was it like maybe an asteroid pulled into Earth's orbit that was around before Earth? Could be. It could be older than the Earth. Or maybe the Earth has more erosion and more. most of those older rocks on Earth are gone. They've eroded away. They've gone into the seas. They've become sand. But on the moon, other than the solar wind, and the occasional impact, there really isn't a lot of erosion. So you can find older, older rocks on the moon than the Earth. But as it turns out, the Earth and the moon are pretty much the same age. And why that is so is uh, because of the, what's called the, the giant impact theory. When Apollo 11 went to the moon, there were three lunar formation theories. And they didn't really know which was which. The first one was called the fission theory, and that was the moon came out of the Earth, probably from really high rotation rate, and, and you had a blob, a molten blob, breaking off the Earth, and that became the moon. The capture theory was that the moon was formed somewhere else in the solar system, wandered in close to the sun near the Earth, the Earth's gravitational field pulled it in, and it started orbiting the Earth. The third theory was, well, uh, something must have impacted the Earth and threw the moon out because so much of the material on the moon resembles the Earth, not only physically but also geochemically. So when they analyzed the moon rocks, they were almost chemically identical to Earth. So of the, of the three theories, the fission and the impact theory would work best for why moon rocks are like Earth rocks. Well, 
the prevailing theory today is the impact theory. So there was a protoplanet about the size of Mars that got too close to Earth, as you can see in that illustration, created a massive impact, and all the molten material that was thrown out included some of the Earth's crust, which ended up on the moon. So there's a little bit of the moon on Earth, and there's a little bit of the Earth on the moon. So as I mentioned earlier, Apollo 11 is still at work with the lunar uh, retro reflectors. Uh, there are a number of university students, undergraduates, maybe some of you guys, when you go to college, uh, you might get a chance to send, shoot a laser beam at the moon at one of these Apollo uh, reflectors, and you can do some experiments and, you know, how long the laser beam speed of light, but uh, when it's maybe over the horizon, you might experiment with that, and also to see whether or not the moon has changed in its distance, has it, is it getting closer, or is it following what the theory is, it's getting farther away from the Earth. Now, we are going back to the moon, at least NASA says we are, the President says we are, they're saying 2024, I think it's awfully fast, uh, but NASA just did a, a kind of a key test of the Orion spacecraft the other week, and it was very successful. And they're just about done building this big replacement. Uh, it, it's the modern equivalent of the Saturn V. It's that big rocket behind all my type, red type there. It's called an SLS, or Space Launch System. It doesn't have a neat name like uh, Saturn. And maybe they'll give it one someday. But it, it uses some of the space shuttle uh, solid rocket uh, technology. You can see those two boosters on the side like the shuttle used to have. And unfortunately, it's not a nice white Taj Mahal looking spacecraft. It's painted, it, it, it's not painted to save weight. Um, I guess NASA eventually figured out that they could save literally millions of dollars in paint and in fuel costs because you add, you paint a large spacecraft, uh, a launcher like that, and you add many hundreds of pounds to the weight of the spacecraft and the cost of getting it into orbit. So it's just a great, uh, an orange foam material that does not get painted. So that will be our next Apollo 11, is will we go back to the moon? The Chinese said they want to get there. Uh, the European Space Agency, they plan on getting there. Uh, and will America be left behind? Uh, we're kind of like we were uh, at the time of Sputnik, where you know, we don't have a space shuttle flying. They're working furiously to get now commercial spacecraft to service the space station, both Boeing, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, what are the other private companies? SpaceX. Yeah, SpaceX. They're all now contracted by NASA to help service the space station, which probably will get a few more, maybe another decade out of it. But um, in the meantime, this new spacecraft uses the exact same, it has a command module, service module. They're working on the lander, which kind of looks like the lunar lander, a little more sophisticated, a little larger. But it's, you know, a proven technology that worked, so why throw it away? And unfortunately, at the end of the Apollo missions, the end of Skylab, um, we got rid of all our Apollo hardware, and we could have continued developing it and improving it and not have to go back and reinvest the money. Somehow we don't seem to get that right. But hopefully this time, maybe we'll go back and we'll go back to stay. Is this the end? <laughs> no, now, I'm, now is my shameless self-promotion. <laughs> uh, I only have two copies of my book, but if you're interested, you can also get it on Amazon. I wrote a book called The Constant Moon, and it's kind of a look at the natural history of the moon. Uh, but also some of the controversies with the scientists, a lot of the egos and personalities, uh, and I got to meet a number of them, uh, and they all tried to set me straight on their story. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting story, and it kind of leads up to uh, the landing of the Apollo missions, but a lot of them were the, uh, like Project Ranger and Surveyor, these were the prelude to Apollo. They flew around the moon, took pictures of the landing sites, what, what would make good landing sites, what weren't good landing sites. But you can find the book on Amazon.com, look for Inconstant Moon, 
the one by me, not by Larry Niven, the science fiction writer. We both use the same title. It's for a novel, mine for a nonfiction. But it's actually, we both stole it from William Shakespeare. <laughs> so, hope you enjoyed it. Any questions? It's great, thank you. Oh, you're welcome, yes. So, is there something called the Bacon uh, battery developed by the, in Britain, the Apollo? Oh, I wish I could say this better, but that's the nickname for it. Hmm. It's kind of a battery. It, it could very well be. I'm not familiar with that. Yeah. I have two. Oh, I have kind of a Stephen Andy question. Yeah. So I know a guy whose father worked on designing the Saturn V. Wow. And also, were all the Apollo astronauts kept in quarantine, like after their turn? No. After the first one, had they? Just the first one, yeah. yeah. In fact, a Apollo 12 uh, landed very near one of those surveyor spacecraft that I mentioned in my book. And they broke off pieces of the arm that, it was like a robot arm that kind of made a trench. So they took pictures of it and, they, and wanted to see the consistency of the lunar soil. Well, they brought back some of the metal from that lander and they found there were microbes on it. So they said, well, they're not from the moon, but these microbes were on this lander when it was launched in 1966. This was 1969 when the astronauts went there. So these things survived in a vacuum uh, for all those years. Now, recent, somebody, a, a, a biologist recently went back, studied it, looked at the data, and said that was contaminated. When it was brought back by Apollo 12, it was not contaminated when it was launched two years earlier, or three years earlier. So, for many, you'll still find books, textbooks that say, you know, that microorganisms from Earth survived on the moon for three years in a vacuum under, you know, total ultraviolet radiation um, in, you know, in a vacuum. And the extremes on, on the, a day on the moon is 200 degrees plus Fahrenheit. You can step, if you're by a big boulder, you can step into the shadow of the boulder and it's minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can literally stand plus 200 degrees, minus 200 degrees if you're in the shade. There's no in-between. Oh um, my goodness. Yeah, the moon is a very harsh place. As the science fiction writer Robert Heinlein said, the moon is a harsh, harsh mistress. And it is. It's, it's a tough place. It's easy to get to, which is why I think it makes more sense to do more moon exploring before going to Mars, because Mars is so far away and we're, humans are going to be in weightless conditions and exposed to extreme radiation for a longer period of time. Now they did monitor, while the Apollo astronauts were there, they did monitor whether or not there were going to be solar eruptions that, you know, you're here today, of coronal mass ejections. Well, supposing you're out on the lunar surface when there's a coronal mass ejection. Now we have good warning systems that they can probably get in a shelter, but they're going to have to consider that. If they're going to stay longer than 24 hours or a couple of days, they're going to have to have ooh, good uh, shielding. I'm going to get electrocuted there. They're going to have to have good, good shielding from solar rays and magnetic rays. So uh, that's another consideration. Anything else? Any other questions? Yes? Go ahead. No, I didn't have anything else. Okay. I'm, what did you write for NASA? Um, I wrote, I basically t uh, wrote stories. Lay, lay language. <laughs> yeah, lay language stories about um, what their high computing program was doing. And they, they were basically doing, thank you, um, computer equivalent of wind tunnel testing. So the Ames Research Center in California, which if you've ever been to the Mountain View, California area, it's around Silicon Valley. There's a huge uh, Zeppelin hangar at Ames. It used to be a naval air base. And some of the, in the 1920s, they flew a couple of Zeppelins that were war reparations from Germany in the First World War. They hangered them there at Mountain View. But uh, 
Ames developed a huge wind tunnel testing operation back in the Mercury days and also rocket uh, testing for stability when you, you know, launch a spacecraft, how it goes through the atmosphere. Uh, then they did work for the FAA where they would wind tunnel test um, aircraft to make sure, you know, is the, is the aircraft stable in high winds, do parts come off of it? Uh, they still do some of that, but a lot of it's now done on computers. But one of my, um, I used to work here in Vermont and then spend about eight weeks a year out in California. But I remember one time when I went on the base, they had a complete 747 jet suspended by wires inside the, the uh, wind tunnel. And they had the doors open, you know, onto the road, and it was just spectacular. And they you know, would close the doors and then wind up the, the wind, which were uh, huge spheres of compressed air that kind of looked like those natural gas cylinders that you see in refineries. It was all filled with air, and they would pump the air into these turbines and then subject the aircraft or spacecraft, whatever they were testing, uh, in real time. But of course, a lot of that now is done by computer model. So you were writing about that. So I was writing about what the work report. they were doing with the X-33 called the Venture Star, which was going to be the replacement for the shuttle. Oh. Plus, they did a lot of outreach to schools. And you know, I did little reports about you know, what, uh, what the California school systems were doing. That was NASA related. And so a lot of that was you know, educational. Oriented. So this, so the information you were writing was for for the public. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was from NASA to the public. Yes, okay. and it was talking with a lot of engineers and understanding what they were doing, and then translating it for the layman. Uh, my undergraduate degree is in radio, television, film, journalism. My master's degree is in space science because I wanted to have the that technical background to be able to write about it. So, and I did, and uh, it was a really exciting period in my life. And got to meet a lot of interesting people. And, you know, you, yes? You get, to the moon, you get to Mars, they might like set up a spacecraft on the moon, side of the moon, and then take off from the moon to Mars? Well, the, the NASA plan is to build what's called the, the Gateway, and that's going to be a lunar orbiting space station. And that will not only service landings on the moon uh, and astronauts going back and forth research, probably mostly scientists, uh, but that, that will also be a staging ground for those going to Mars. So they'll have a place to stop, uh, you know. Refuel. Yeah, refresh, um, maybe pick up uh, equipment. Uh, but it will have to be done in stages because right now, um, you know, trip to Mars would probably be about a year and a half, I think. Uh, it's a long time to be in deep space. Uh, and you have to have some kind of a radiation shelter on the spacecraft. It could be maybe under your water tanks, where water's a good radiation insulation. But, um, you know, the, the astronauts are still exposed to that going to the moon, but Mars, it's a much longer time period. And then when you're on the surface of Mars, you have a lot of other things to consider. Uh, supposing you break a leg, uh, you know, the moon, you're only three days away. You can get the astronaut back or get them up to the space station orbiting the moon gateway. On Mars, it's not so easy. So Mars is a lot more complicated. A lot of the space enthusiasts say, you know, why go back to the moon? Let's go to Mars. And it has a romantic appeal to it, but it, it's, I think it requires a lot more staging and preparation, and I think going back to the moon is going to be a much better way of doing it. So, but NASA still, in my opinion, has a kind of a split personality on it. You know, there's half the NASA that just wants to go to Mars and half that wants to go to the moon. And that is somewhat troubling, because we've seen multiple attempts to return to the moon since the 1960s that have failed politically. Because you know you get a new administration and they want to dismantle everything the previous president did because they didn't like it. Like Bush and Obama, like Bush tried to set up that. Well, well, yeah, and Obama dismantled everything Bush did, you know, and we could have been back on the moon. But you know, everybody wants to play politics. But then they also feel the money's better spent somewhere else. 
So, I don't know. Some of the architecture from the Constellation, which was the Bush plan to go back to the moon, that's still in place. That um, The big launcher there is kind of a variation of what was called the Ares under the Bush plan. And so the SLS is the Obama rocket. And uh, thankfully, the current president didn't get rid of that. He could have. Uh, and probably was close to it, but somebody wiser heads prevailed and talked him out of it. And that was a good thing. Uh, you know, at some point, you have to make the investment and stay with it. You can't keep changing it, and, uh, or else you'll never get anywhere. But again, I go back to what I said uh, when I opened this talk, which is, had there not been a Cold War, I, I think we would have had to wait maybe Till now, maybe another 50 years, a century, before we would have actually gone to the moon without any political competition of, you know, east versus west, and we have a better system than your system, and uh, right now there's really not that kind of thing, but I think NASA's going right because they're doing an international approach. For example, the service module of this new spacecraft is being built by the Europeans, so they have an investment in it. We don't have to spend all the money. They're, they're spending the money on some of that hardware. And I assume that when the astronauts are picked, uh, there's definitely going to be a woman. She's probably going to be, I think NASA wants to put a woman on the moon, be the first one out after all the men did it in Apollo. I'm fine with that. That's great. Um, but I think we'll have a more international crew. It's not a true international mission yet. I mean, it's not all the... Not all the countries, European Space Agency, Russians, Chinese. Chinese are way up, they're after. They don't want they don't want, they want to want to go off. They want to do what the Americans do. Right. Say. And they have the money to do it. We don't. We're in debt. they they have all our money. So they they will likely do it, although we have the, I think the better technology and the better architecture. So it remains to be seen who gets there first, but I think we probably with some European and Japanese uh, astronauts will probably back there. I, I'm all for international cooperation in space because it's an expensive endeavor and it's nice when everybody has a piece of the pie, um, then it's more likely to succeed. So. And also since there's not much political, not as much political tension right now, people aren't going to be like, right. well, I refuse to work with these guys. Yeah. I want to get all yeah. the credit. And, and I forgot to mention the Russians too because they'll be involved. Uh, I think they'll, they're doing some of the gateway station that I mentioned that's going to orbit the moon. They're going to work on that because they're good at space stations. So everybody has their specialty. Yeah, they need work. And yep. Very successful. All right, well, thank you. I'm sorry for spilling uh, some precious water on the moon that instantly evaporated. But thank you very much. All right, take care.